Okay, there is no name attached to this email address, just an email address. So I don't know who wrote this. I've been mountain biking my entire life. I love the outdoors. I had a custom mountain bike made by Seven Cycles in Massachusetts. It had a titanium frame, a belt drive, and a 14-speed roll-off gearing. It was very light and it was incredibly strong. I could ride this bike anywhere. I decided to do an overnight hammock camping trip. I thought I would use the mountain bike. Right out of my house and five miles down the road is a 200-acre wildlife refuge. Late in the fall, the woods in Connecticut are very beautiful, so this would be a gorgeous trip. People drive from all over the country to see the golden display of the fall leaves. I loaded my bike with 20 pounds of gear, food, water, and my camera and a carbon tripod. I had thought that I would try some low-light photography and see how it came out. It was getting dark in another 90 minutes, so I brought my helmet and handlebar LED lights. The handlebar light is 1,700 lumens, and I can ride at night just as fast as I can during the day. The helmet is nice because it always points where you're looking. I rode into the woods and I took about an hour and 15 minutes to get far enough in so that I wouldn't have to worry about anyone seeing me. And after I dragged my bike and my gear up a big hill to get more than a 300 feet off the trail to find a good spot, by that time it was dark. There were two trees, 20 feet apart, with no Widowmaker dead limbs on them, and I strung my hammock between them. I put a tarp above the hammock. It was a nice night, so I tied the sides of the tarp up so I could see 360 degrees. I heated some water to make coffee. After 20 years in the Navy, I just can't live without my coffee. And then I had a snack, and it was pitch dark. There was no moon and no stars to be seen that night. If I turned off my headlamp, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. It's not a good night for photography. Regardless, I set up the camera and took some long exposure shots and got just what I expected, a picture of black. My camping is zero impact. There is no fire and I leave the site exactly as if I had never been there. On past trips, I learned that the animals know you were there. It seems to disturb them that a human is hanging out in their home in the middle of the night. Usually, just after dark, the woods come to life and everything is moving. Some animals are curious and will come close to see what is hanging between the trees. It tends to keep you up, but I found it very interesting because it is amazing how well animals communicate with each other. The ones that came close would always give out some kind of sound that was responded to by more than one distant animal. Small rodents would scurry through the leaves right underneath you. The dry leaves made it so that you could hear anything moving. Well, I climbed into my hammock and I covered up and I was comfortable and warm. My head was on an inflatable pillow so I could see out. I hung my 1700 lumen handlebar light just above my head on a ridge line in case something big came in close. This night was different. There wasn't a sound. I was in the middle of a wildlife refuge and I couldn't hear a thing. My ears are very good. I was a sonar technician and my ears were tested quarterly by the Navy. My hearing tests indicate that when I retired, my ears were just as sensitive as they were when I was 17 years old. The unusual quiet was disturbing. Well, I got bored and I closed my eyes and I dozed off. I was awakened a few hours later by movement. There was something close rustling in the leaves. I heard a distant chattering to the south, which was answered by the same to the north, and then a third chatter that was close to the west. After many minutes of quiet, a fear suddenly came over me. It was a fear that I never in my life have experienced. I've served on submarines, I survived an onboard fire, and a couple of loss of depth controls close to test depth, and I can tell you that the fear that I felt that night brought back those memories because it was so strong. The difference was that this time was the fear in my head and it was not in my gut. 
It gave me goosebumps all over my body. I retrieved my hanging light from the ridge line and made sure my thumb was on the switch. Whatever was out there, if it got too close, it was going to get blinded by that light. I was unarmed, so the light and my Leatherman were all I had. The next thing I knew, I heard steps approaching. There were two steps at a time approaching from the east, and then there was a long pause. The pause between the steps sent adrenaline through my veins. This time they were walking right toward me, and I knew it was there. This went on for what seemed like forever, and then I heard two steps followed by what sounded like a massive log hitting the ground, hard enough to reverberate the earth underneath, making it sound hollow. I managed to stay in my hammock after I was startled by that thump, and then I was wondering if I had the courage to let this thing get any closer. I'm guessing the first thump was 50 yards away. Each additional step were followed by the same loud thump. This thing was trying to get a start out of me. The camera was on the bag on my bike, and I was too clumsy to use my phone at the same time as the light. I would be risking dropping my light, and I decided against getting the shot. When I got to the point that I felt it was six steps from me looking into my hammock, I turned that light on. It was so bright that I could see the dust floating in the air. I saw two eyes. They were red, and they were really high off the ground. The eyes dropped low and then swung back and forth. All I could see was the eyes. No antlers, no tan fur, just eyes. The eyes swung back and forth, seeming to try to get out of the intense light. It seemed like forever, but after a few seconds, I decided to give the animal an out, and I shut the light off. Whatever this was, it took off like a rocket. I could hear every massive, powerful footstep and branches snapping as it blindly trudged to the north. In seconds, this thing was at least a half a mile away before I could no longer hear it. Well, it got quiet, and I calmed down, and I thought, wow, and then I dozed back off. I woke up just after sunrise. I never sleep long. I was surprised it was being light already. I checked the area out where the creature had approached. There was a huge bush in that direction with no leaves left on it. Whatever this thing was, there was no place for it to hide. Therefore, I am perplexed why I only saw the eyes. Looking at my camp area for the first time in daylight, I realized that I had hung my hammock right in the middle of a very heavily traveled animal path. Honestly, I can't say what those eyeballs belong to. I still go hammock camping, and I've never had any experience like this again. That's the end of the story. Whew! Man! Man! That's a scary story. I don't... <laughs> It's one thing to be in pitch black dark inside your bedroom. It's another thing to be in pitch black dark out in the open forest where creatures walk around and you hear something walking up to you. You turn on your light and there's two red eyes. Holy crap, that would scare me to death. This is a great story. I really appreciate the man sending it. Thank you. All right, all right. Welcome to the podcast. I've got six stories in this podcast. Six. You just heard one, you're about to hear five more. Six less one equals five if you studied math in school, like I did. I'm a genius. I can cipher. All right, enough blabbering. Let's get going with this podcast. I appreciate you clicking on the video and punching the podcast from Spotify or Apple or wherever you're listening from. Let's get rolling with it. All right, here we go. Here's an email about a Bigfoot encounter, and I don't have the writer's name. Nobody's including their names today. So let's go ahead and read his email. It's really good. When I was a kid, I lived a mile from my school. Sometimes when I was in a hurry, I'd walk the highway to get home faster. I liked to explore the woods back then. One day on one of my explorations, I wandered down a couple of different logging roads that cut through the woods and I discovered that they took me to the school as well. They were less travel than the highway, but still easily walked, and it took a little longer to go that way, but it gave me time for myself. 
One late fall day when I didn't have to be home right away to babysit my brother, I decided to go that route instead. It was a kind of beautiful fall day when I could let my mind wander and enjoy the peace and quiet of the woods. I hadn't gone far and I noticed something big and black was following me a hundred yards away. I thought it was a bear and my heart began to race. And then I realized it had stopped walking and it slinked behind a tree. I could tell it was black as night and it was really big. It was muscular with short hair like a gorilla. He couldn't hide from me, though he obviously didn't like it. I had had one encounter with a Bigfoot before. It was a friendly one. I was pretty sure this one wasn't going to be friendly, though. He walked toward me a few steps and then stopped as if he were pondering what to do. My adrenaline levels were already through the roof, so I bolted. He proceeded to follow me. I was running with all my might, but he seemed to be running with ease as if he was just pacing me. Fear was pushing me onward as fast as I could go. I threw my books aside and I ran until my lungs felt like they were going to burst. I wasn't looking anymore to see if it was behind me. I just wanted to go home. Finally, when my heart felt like it was thundering in my throat, I stopped and looked around, and the creature was gone. I looked all around me several times and I didn't see him anywhere, but I didn't trust it so I took off running again and I didn't stop until I got home. I struggled to get the key in the door but somehow I managed and once I was inside I slammed the door shut and I locked it. I knew from my last experience that this wouldn't keep him out. My last encounter taught me that. I spent the rest of the day freaked out and scared. I never went back through those woods again. I got into a lot of trouble at school for losing my books, but I didn't care. I wasn't going back in there for them. That was his territory, and he could keep it. Heck yeah, man. If you see a Bigfoot in the woods, don't go back in there, ever. That's That would be my motto. If uh, Books or uh, your wallet or your cell phone, just leave it. Don't go back in there. But this was uh, such a good story. I mean, the guy was actually chased by a Bigfoot. That is really cool. Really cool. It's a great story. Fits this channel perfect. And I appreciate him sending it. This writer wants to keep his name on the down low. It's a secret. He doesn't want you to know his name. Not because of him, but because of his family, he says. I've lived here at the foot of the mountain in southeast Oklahoma for over 20 years, and I have seen these critters twice. However, I have heard them many times. They either howl, whoop, chatter, or make their bird sounds, which, if it was a bird, it would have to be as big as a house to make a sound that loud. They eat the pears off my trees, but they always bring me one with no marks on it, a perfect pear. They lay it down in the same spot in my driveway every time, where I can see it from where I sit on the porch to have my morning coffee. If they were out to hurt me, they would have ample opportunities to do so. They haven't hurt any critters that lives on this land either. But I don't go on that mountain. I have no reason to do so. The first time I saw one of these things, I glanced out the window of a bedroom while I was walking down the hall, and there it was. There was a face looking in the window. I could tell it was a young one. It was gray with large eyes looking back at me. When I realized what I saw, I stepped back and looked at the window again, but it was gone. My second sighting was when I was putting clothes in my washing machine and I glanced out the window above the washer. It was at the far end of the pond walking back up toward the mountain. It was very nonchalant, paying no attention to anything. It was just walking up the mountain. This one was very shiny black. It may have been in the pond that is farther away from my house. I don't know for sure. What I do know for sure is that it was not a bear. A few days later, my husband and I went to where we saw it walking, and we measured up a tree to see how tall it was. I had seen it walk behind this tree and I knew where its head leveled off. The small tree came to the hairy person's waist. When my husband walked behind it, the tree was above his head. My husband is six feet tall. The hairy person had to be nine feet tall. 
Now to get to the meat of the conversation. They are here and they are real. There's ample proof out there and no, they're not great apes. Their DNA has been tested and tested and some more. They do have bodies. The question we should be asking is why is the government trying to keep them secret from the people? They're not a joke or a scary story to tell around a campfire. They're real, and the DNA results have shown them to be human hybrids. Every American should be after our devious government to tell us what they know of these things. Why all the big secrets? Is it all about the money, or is it something else? I just want to know, don't you? The government has finally, after all these years, said that there are UFOs out there. The American people have known that for years. Who was to benefit from that secret? And who is to benefit from the secret of the Bigfoots? Voices United makes a mighty roar. And that's the end of her story. And I don't know about this DNA thing. I think some YouTuber said that at one point. I don't even know that the people testing the DNA know what the DNA is from. I mean, we, we can't even get a picture of this thing. So, I don't know. I'm... I'm dubious of the DNA evidence. I hear it talked about all the time. Oh, there was some woman who did the DNA stuff, they claim. And I hear that story over and over and over. But I've never seen a report on it. And have you? Do you know how to re read a DNA report? If you do, surely the results are on the internet. Get them out and explain it to us. Make a video and explain it. You know, this strand here proves it's a human. This strand here proves it's a hybrid. I don't know. You can't just go around saying the DNA proves that they're real because if you can't get a picture of them, they're not real. They're, there's just no proof. Now, I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just saying we need more evidence than someone just saying there's DNA. However, I do not doubt this woman has seen something out her window and seen things walking up that mountain. And I don't blame her for not going up that mountain. You see these big, dark, hairy things walking up the mountain? I wouldn't go up there either. So this isn't against her. She's not any different than most of the people that follow the Bigfoot topic. It's the DNA. The DNA's been tested. Oh, it's all settled. It's all settled. Well, where's the Bigfoot? That's what I want to know. Anyway, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here because those are the questions the general public asks. Okay, the, you say the DNA proves it. Where's the report? Nobody can produce a report. Someone wrote it in a book or said it on a YouTube video. You see my point? So we have to have better evidence than than just, you know, popping off things that we think have been proved when they may really not have been proved. Okay, I'm off my soapbox. Now, everybody can comment, Oh, I can't believe you do these stories and you don't believe. I did not say I didn't believe. I said, if you're going to prove they're real, you got to have more than that. You just got to have more than that. All right, that's enough of that. Thank you for the story, ma'am. I thought it was really good. All right, I got the, I, I know the writer's name of this email, but they want to be anonymous, and that's just dandy with me. But here's what they write. It's a Bigfoot story. In November and December of 2018, my husband and I were moving into our new home in a small town in Ohio. Our new neighborhood was comprised of mostly small homes with a lot of wooded lots mixed in. Beyond our neighborhood was all countryside and woods. There's a steel mill not far from us, and there were power lines and a railroad track fairly close. We were excited to move into our new smaller house in a different city. We were retired and looking forward to the fun times ahead. My husband would stay at the old house packing things up sometimes overnight, while I was at the new one unpacking. Our house sits on a corner lot with a motion-activated security light over the garage. With our neighbor's garage running alongside our driveway, we have the feeling of extra privacy. We were happy to get that. We have neighbors all around us, but everyone minds their business. We watch out for each other, but not to the point of being annoying. Right away, I began to hear taps on the windows and the side of the house. And sometimes I'd smell something awful, but I attributed all of this to nerves from being in the new house alone at night. Sometimes the security light would flash on and off as well, 
But again, I told myself I just needed to get used to living in the new place. One night, my husband had brought home another load from the old house. He'd loaded some of it up, but we were exhausted, so we decided to go to bed and finish up the next morning. We drifted off to sleep pretty quick. Suddenly, we were woken up by what felt like a car being driven into the side of the house. The whole place seemed to shake. It was so loud and we could smell a terrible odor. We shot up in bed wondering what in the world had just happened. My husband ran outside to look around, but we didn't see anything. There wasn't even any damage to the house. The odor grew fainter after a few minutes, but nothing else happened. He decided to stay an extra day after that to make sure everything was okay. Except for the odor, nothing else happened. Our tiny dog would not go outside at night. Instead, he would bark and stare. And then there was that smell. Every night, that awful odor would come back. I still shake thinking about it. I was glad when my husband finally brought the last load and was home for good. For a while, the only thing that was strange was the odor, and I refused to go in the kitchen at night because the odor seemed to follow wherever I went. It was like nothing I had ever smelled before. It was indescribable. There was one night when I thought I heard a tornado siren going off, but there were no weather reports or any storms at all that night. Things began to quiet down after that, except for the occasional slap on the side of the house or the roof if I was in the shower. Then came the night of the first ground-covering snow. Our curtains were open as my husband and I sat on the couch watching a DVD. I noticed the security light was flipping on and off, but my husband was sure it was being caused by the snow. I joked with him that maybe someone was playing peekaboo around the neighbor's garage. And then I saw a big shadow darting back and forth, but I put it off to my imagination. After a while, it stopped and we went back to watching our movie. A little after 11, I nearly jumped out of my skin when I heard a loud knock on our side of the door that faced the neighbor's garage. It caught me off guard. It was two policemen asking if I had seen anything. A neighbor had reported that something big, not someone, something, was watching our house from beside the garage. My husband was unloading some things, I told them. Well, no, ma'am, it wasn't him, they said. Well, he's the only one who's been out there, I explained. No, it wasn't him, the officers repeated. But you've never even met him, I pointed out. Well, they laughed and said that he would not match the description. Well, what is the description, I asked. They laughed and said they'd followed tracks around the neighbor's garage that went through our backyard and we needed to look. And then they asked if I was sure I had not seen anything. Well, I told them about the security light going on and off, but I left off the rest. Again, they said we needed to look at the tracks in our back lot. And then they said that we should be sure that our trash is secure because of bears, and then they left. I asked my husband to go out into the backyard and look at those tracks. And when he came in, he was white as a sheet, and he said he'd never seen anything like it. He said it was like barefoot footprints in the snow, except they were really large. It wasn't until we heard your show and we looked up prints that he said that that's what they look like. They were 18 inches long, and they were barefooted. Everything fit. The tracks, the horrible odor, everything. Did we see anything? Well, I did see a shadow, but it was a very large shadow. And I wonder still if my eyes were playing tricks on me. It was snowing hard that night. But what about the slaps on the side of the house and the roof? What about the car that hit the house but left no damage? And how about those tracks? And that smell. And why did my dog act so strange? We still don't know which neighbor called the cops that night. Only two houses are positioned so that they could have seen anything. We only had a few slaps this year. But still, I shake just writing this. I just wanted to tell someone who wouldn't think I'm crazy. And by the way, we Google bear sightings in our area. 
and there are no bears here. Holy moly. Man, that's another scary story. This woman must have been a wreck, and even her husband after they saw those tracks. Uh, I, I, I mean, I want to sit here and say it wasn't a Bigfoot, but it sure sounds like it was. I don't know. I don't, I have no idea. I don't know where they are. They, uh, let's see. Does she, oh, it's in a small town in Ohio, and they live close to a steel mill. So I don't know. There's a lot of Bigfoot sightings in Ohio. It's quite possible, quite possible. What a great story. I love the way she put this together and it, it, the suspense kind of built and built and built. The woman at home taking a shower, slaps on the roof, her husband's gone. Her, You know, they finally discover, man, it's just, it scared the crap out of them. But it, uh, the way she put it together, it was, uh, it was a great story to read. So thank you, ma'am, for sending it. Okay, here's another writer who wants to keep their name on the DL. It's a big secret, and I don't blame them, because sometimes you don't want this stuff getting out. But here's what she writes. This is one of the best stories I've read in a few weeks. I thought it was great. My best friend and I were coming back to Corpus Christi after being out on her dad's ranch close to Premont, Texas. I'm going back many years. Her and I are 60 years old now. We were about 19 at the time of this incident. We were there to tend to some things on her dad's ranch, and it took us longer than we expected. Instead of going straight home, we took a detour to her Aunt V's house. Aunt V insisted that we stay and have supper with them, which we did. She asked what route we would take home. Well, I knew of a shortcut that would save us time, and I told her that was the plan. Aunt V shook her head and warned us not to go down that shortcut at night. The road was narrow and sometimes it was in bad shape, she said. Stay on the main highway, she told us. It'll be safer. We promised her that we would, but after filling the tank at the gas station, we chose to take the shortcut anyway. It would turn out to be a big mistake. We knew about a few of the legends concerning the area where the shortcut passed through, but we didn't believe them. We were in a Cadillac, and it was fast and smooth, and it had a great sound system. On we went toward the shortcut. We drove with music way up loud. We sang along. We were having a great time. It was a dark and spooky sort of night, but the last worry on our minds was that shortcut. It's isolated, and there are no houses or gas stations or even cows in the area. It's creepy even in the middle of the day. This was during the fall, sometime close to Thanksgiving break. The leaves were mostly fallen, and we could see a long way. Even in the dark, because of the moonlight and the stars, the woods were clear to us. However, when we approached that back road, it suddenly became oppressively dark and cold. I didn't want to go any further, and I told Addie to turn around. It felt creepy to me, I said, but we couldn't turn around because the car was too long. The road was narrow, and there were ditches on either side of it, and there was nowhere to get off the road. It started to get foggy, and Addie switched the headlights to see better. The atmosphere changed rapidly, and we lost the radio. The fog was so thick, we could barely make out the front of the car and it was thick as soup, seeming to absorb the light from the headlights. The car slowed down on its own. It seemed to crawl, no matter how much Addie depressed the accelerator. Well, we started to freak out a bit, and Addie was screaming. I pushed myself over the console and pressed my foot onto Addie's to give the car some gas, but still the car just creeped along, almost as if something were blocking our way like we were pushing something. Now we were both terrified that the car would stall. The fear was so thick you could have cut it with a knife. I could sense something otherworldly and outright evil around us, something we couldn't see. We began to pray out loud for God to help us get out of there. I told Addie over and over not to look out the car. I didn't know what was out there, but I felt like if we looked at it, that it would gain full control of us. Time began to twist in a way. One minute, I felt like we were in slow motion, and the next, 
we were speeding through time at light speed. We soon became disoriented, but we struggled against this force and we kept praying. The car finally started moving, and before we knew it, we were flying down that foggy road at a hundred miles an hour. I had enough wits about me left to scream at Addie to slow down, but in her fear she had pressed the pedal to the floor, not thinking of anything other than getting away from the area. By some miracle, we didn't hit a tree or even run off in the ditch, which by all rights we should have. The fog began to thin and I saw that we were square in the middle of the road. She didn't slow much, but she was finally under a hundred. The further we drove, the better the visibility became and soon we rolled into town. And as soon as we crossed into civilization, the radio popped on again and it was blaring the song we had been so happy listening to. And it made us jump and I reached over to turn the radio off. Well, we were now going at the speed limit, and I could see smoke coming from under the hood and wafting over the windshield. The fuel gauge showed less than one-eighth of a tank. We had just filled it up a few minutes ago. The shortcut is 14 miles long. It was supposed to save us a net 35 miles. But two hours had ticked off the clock. Two hours to travel 14 miles? Figure that one out. We told her mom about what we did and what happened to us, and she said she started to pray because we were so late getting home. A look of horror came over her face when we told her about the road that we had taken, and she made the sign of the cross as we unloaded the whole story. Her mother is gone now, but she was the only one who believed us. Her dad thought we were drag racing boys because the engine was rough and the oil was low. My mother and father just looked at each other when I told them the story, and they never said a word, but I could tell they knew something. My parents sternly changed the subject to something else, and that was the end of it. Years have gone by, and Addie and I talk about this incident occasionally, and we count ourselves blessed that we escaped with our lives. There are many different stories about this back road, from ghosts to alien abductions. The ghost stories go back centuries to the time of the conquistadors. Something evil lives there, and it wants that area all to itself. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, I love that story. So if they're 60 now and they were 19, that was probably back in the 80s, early 80s, late 70s, sometime around then. Those Cadillacs had those giant engines in them, and they were huge cars, and I can see them not being able to turn that car around. You'd have had to back all the way out the way you came in to, uh, to get back to where you started. So really, there's no choice but to go forward. So maybe that's a lesson. Sometimes shortcuts down old, torn up roads are maybe not a good idea. But I love this story, and I couldn't wait to share it with you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you to the writer. It was, it was really good. Thank you very much. All right, this last story is from Bruce, and you're going to think this story is totally nuts. You're going to think this guy's off his rocker. Uh, I wouldn't say that, because as weird as this story is, it actually jogged a memory that I had that I had forgotten. And I'm not going to tell the story. I'm going to tell his story, not my story, but at some point, I'll probably tell my story, but I need to think on it so that I can remember, try to remember as many details as I can. But let's get into Bruce's story because this is a doozy. I've decided to tell you about my encounter I had back in the early 1970s. Something tells me that even the diehard Bigfoot enthusiasts might think I'm nuts, but after listening to one of your tales about two duck hunters seeing a Bigfoot, and then telling everybody they knew, in spite of not being taken serious, I knew that I would eventually tell this story to you. Like the duck hunters, I too tell the story as often as I can, not because people believe it, but just to tell the story. I have yet to have anyone stop me in midstream before the tale is over. I'm in my 63rd year, and I don't much care if people believe me, 
When I was 15, I decided to hitchhike to Atlanta, Georgia, where my older brother had moved a few years before. It was summer break, and I had nothing but time on my hands. I remember the day was hot when I departed Ann Arbor, Michigan. Now, remember, the further south I went, the hotter it got. The weird thing about this trip was the first guy that picked me up was going all the way to Florida, and he happened to be a real friendly guy. This was when Interstate I-75 was just being built through the tallest mountains of Tennessee, and though the road was perfect, the downside was that there were no rest stops where one could stop to relieve himself, nor were there gas stations or anything else. By the time we got to the Kentucky-Tennessee state line, I had to pee, but for some reason I decided to pass up the offer when I had the chance. Somewhere in the highest elevations of Tennessee, I practically ordered the driver to stop as soon as he could so that I could get rid of what felt like several gallons ready to explode. He told me that he would pull over at the next lookout pull-off, which was a paved area for equipment and supplies used earlier before the crews headed further down the road. It was like a sign from God when we came upon one of these lookouts. The place was full of cars. I bolted from the car and hopped over the guardrail, and I made my way down a paved ditch. I noticed that the older lady we had parked next to was watching me the whole time. I thought I had found a place to pee so that I had some privacy, but when I looked up over my shoulder, I could see her stretching her head watching me, and I walked further down past a hill that blocked her view. It was a long time emptying my bladder. And while I stood there, I heard a noise that sounded like a chipmunk, but it was a lot bigger. It was coming nearer, and I expected to see it cross the ditch any second. I don't know if I was in shock or that I had to pee so bad, but when this thing popped out of the woods just 15 feet below me, I didn't move a muscle other than a steady flow from me relieving myself I didn't move at all and became part of the landscape as best I could. I was thinking that if I live through this, no one will believe me if I tell them. And as I was musing over the fact that these creatures have been extinct for millions of years, the creature turned its head my way and made squeaking chirps as if from a giant chipmunk. But mind you, this was no chipmunk. It was a five-foot-tall dinosaur. I'll give you a moment to compose yourself. It was standing broadside in front of me, facing to my left, and he was fixed on my position. This thing had huge muscular legs with a stretched out tail, just like in the pictures, and it had little arms which were bent up at the elbows with its hands closer to its head. Its head was a dino typical, having a large jaw filled with several razor sharp teeth. At least that's what they looked like to me. This whole encounter lasted for no more than 30 seconds, but in my vulnerable position, it seemed much longer. With a couple of more squeaks, it turned and continued its journey to the left of me, and it disappeared into the woods. After I finished my business, I walked up the mountain hoping that the old woman had seen what had just taken place, but she was no longer there. So, of course, I had to tell someone about my strange encounter, and I told the dude that I'd been traveling with for the past few hours. And even though I felt better about telling someone, this man didn't have a thing to say. But I could tell by the look on his face that he thought I was crazy, which, after I had finished telling my story, he didn't hesitate to confirm. I saw what I saw, and it doesn't matter what people think. I know it's true. Over time, people have suggested various animals that it might have been, but nothing ever came close. Years later, I happened to be in my home in Michigan, and a TV commercial came on advertising the new King Tut exhibit, which would open the following weekend in Chicago, Illinois. The commercial was from the view of a man holding a camera as he walked past a giant dinosaur on the main level of a museum and up a set of stairs to the Tut exhibit and then down the hall to the left where there was a closed door. The camera came to that door and then slowly opened the door, revealing my old friend from Tennessee, meaning 
I could see the dinosaur there in the background. I instantly blurted out to my wife, who, by the way, also thinks my dino story is a figment of an overreaching imagination. We're going to Chicago, I said. The following weekend, we were in the car headed to the dinosaur exhibits. King who? I wasn't interested in some old has-been king. No, I had unfinished business, and I was about to have the proof at my fingertips at any moment. We arrived in Chicago and pulled into the museum, and it didn't take long before I was viewing firsthand the same view I'd seen days before in the commercial. We quickly passed the giant dinosaur on the main floor, and I was thankful that it wasn't the one that walked out on the trail so many years ago because it was a big one. We flew past the king what's-his-name, and as the door down the hallway was beckoning me to come closer. Finally, after decades, I would soon be standing face to face with the creature I had seen in Tennessee. My hand turned the knob on the door, and when it swung open, there it was on a platform three feet off the ground behind the door. Honey, that's the exact same one. This is the creature I saw, I said to my wife. I wasn't aware of how many people were in the room until it suddenly got quiet, but now... Only in a whisper, I repeated myself to make sure my wife understand what I had experienced all those years ago. I still don't think she believes me. Well, that's my story, and I'd be interested if anyone else has had such an encounter. Other than that, thank you again for allowing these kinds of stories to be told. Have a good day. Bruce. Oh, someone sees a dinosaur in 1970. Okay, that sounds pretty crazy. However, like I said before I started this story, I saw something when I was a kid. I think I was uh, maybe 10 years old. We were at a vacation property that my parents owned. And I had been out hiking all day with my brother and my sister and my cousins. And we kind of got split up and I was on my own. And I saw something like this for a brief second and then it was gone. And I'm going to try to put my thoughts together and tell that story. Uh, I'm saying this all in response to the writer who says he was wondering if anybody else had had such an encounter. Those are his exact words. I don't know what I saw, but I'm going to try to think on it and try to recreate that image in my mind and see if I can't tell you all that story. So thanks to Bruce for sending this story. It was great. I really appreciate it. I love stories like this. And I actually believe him. I believe he saw something strange that day. I don't know if it was a dinosaur, but it's pretty interesting. Good stuff. Good stuff. Once again, thanks for following along with the podcast. I really appreciate you. If you thought it was good enough, give me a thumbs up. Maybe hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell notification so you don't miss any of these episodes. Follow along with the podcast. If nothing else, if you see it pop up on your recommend screen, give the next video a try. You might like some of the stories you hear. Other than that, thanks for hanging with me, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks. Thanks.